What's good, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Pro and Bro Wrestling Podcast. We are your host. I'm Arnold Telega Arda. And I am Mr. No Days Off, Fred Rosser. And what is this, episode 56? 56, man. 56. And I said uh, on a prior podcast that ultimately we would have all the members of the Nexus on, not Daniel Bryan, because according to, <laughs> according to Wade Barry, he says that it was only seven of us, you know? <laughs> um, so we've had Heath on, we've had Tarver on. Heath is making moves and impact. Tarver uh, was on our podcast. I always say, don't die with a story and you tell it. And this episode, we have second generation superstar who was trained by his father, debuting in 1997. He's an OG in this business. Uh, he competed in the UK, South Africa. I think you know where we're going. He's a futurist, uh, biohacker, world traveler, uh, spiritual gangster, <laughs> the werewolf himself, PJ Black, formerly known as Justin Gatable. We don't use former Gabriel. PJ Black, thank you for being on Promo Wrestling, man. You are an OG. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. I've been uh, watching you guys from day one, so I'm very excited to dive into some stuff. Wow, thank you for that, man. How have you been doing with this whole craziness that's 2020? You know, I usually ask people that and begin the podcast and I, I, I get different answers. But from you, I feel, like, uh, I feel like you've been handling this very well because to me, I just feel like you're an individual who's, who's at, at peace and who's like in control <laughs> of like their situation. And I know that has to do a lot with, you know, um, meditating and yoga and your fasting. So, um, how has that kicked in in 2020 for you? It, you know, it's been amazing. I ha it's been tough for everybody, but I, I used this time productively. You know, I, um, I never used to read as a kid. Um, since, I've been, <laughs> since I've been opened up, I guess you can call it, I've been going through like uh, two books a week. Wow. Um, I, I signed up for a couple of online classes. I got my level two Reiki certification. I did a sound engineer course. Oh. Um, I started writing a book. I'm writing a book on biohacking right now. I'm very excited yeah. about that. Um, I, th I thought I'd have it done by Christmas, but there's so much research and there's so much new technology out there that I feel like it, the research is going to take another year, but I'm in no rush, you know, I'm like, I, I have so many things going on right now, but uh, sure. just enjoying it, you know, just being productive and creative trying to be creative and just you know not let all this politic bs <laughs> like bother me and it, it's yeah. tough sometimes but uh you know I'm, I'm some somehow some of these conspiracy theories are becoming conspiracy facts so i've yeah. somehow become a theorist <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's funny you mentioned um reiki and i actually heard of that for the first time last year because my wife did that and she had an incredible experience. And um, that's something that I actually want to try sometime when, you know, things are starting to open up and become more safer. But that's such a powerful, powerful um, process, man. How do you even begin to, to work at that? Yeah, I, you know what? I, I started out just doing research for the book because the book is about biohacking. So there's a lot of... A lot of chapters on frequency, energy, vibration. As we know, that's what everything consists of, right? Our, mm -hmm. our reality. So I just wanted to dive deeper into that. And then I found out how powerful things like that is, like the sound healing with the, with the, with the, four, the tuning forks, but Reiki is hands-on. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize this. You, can, you don't even have to do it in person. You can do it over Zoom. You can do it over the, over the phone mm -hmm. because everything's connected. All our energy is, belongs to one, the one consciousness. Like people don't realize that. And I didn't, I didn't understand that at first until I experienced that. And uh, yeah, it's powerful. And you, and you start off by, by healing yourself, you know, you get the body movements and you do um, all, everything on yourself. And then you kind of, I haven't, I've only treated like one other person, but like, you know, I'm, I'm still learning and it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's, it really is something to that, dude. It's incredible experience. And there's only a few Reiki masters, like mm -hmm. I think probably like 11 of them. And I worked with two of them and it's, it's crazy because they never say they're, they're psychic, you know, because sure. people would... When someone says they're psychic, you kind of be like, ah, whatever. You know, they never say that. But one, once they do a reading for you, you'll be like, what? Like, how do you know all that? So, yeah. and, and, and there's definitely something to it because everything's connected to that grid to, around our planet, you know, and even, even, even Mother Gaia, we're, we're all connected. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true, man. 
First of all, PJ, uh, when we started, uh, that was uh, uh, there was a dog barking. Is the dog vicious or delicious? I hope it's not vicious. <laughs> no, he's my little buddy. I'll show you guys now. He's my he's my life. He has an Aww. Instagram too. His name's Amor Tokyo. He's he's amazing. Oh, oh, what kind of breed? He's he's a, he's a Pikachu. Half oh. Pikachu. <laughs> half half Pikachu, half Shawa. T, come here. Look at this guy. Oh, he's perfect, man. Oh, how old is he? He's uh one, almost almost two, I think. Oh man, I'm I'm a fur dad myself. I have one Shih Tzu and uh two Persian cats, all boys, and they are like they have my heart, man. They're they're everything. Same. He has the he has the same birthday as Snoop Dogg and my. <laughs> <laughs> Did you consider naming him Snoop because of that? <laughs> well, we we named him Tokyo because Tokyo is one of my favorite places. Mm -hmm. I live in Little Tokyo in um, in LA, and one of our favorite TV shows. Uh, there's a, I don't know if you guys have ever watched Money Heist on Netflix. There's a there's a, a gangster girl, and her name she's like this uh, Italian girl, and her name is Tokyo. <laughs> ah, I like. And he's that, pretty. Man. He's pretty gangster. <laughs> Arnold, Arnold. A couple of weeks ago, I had. Uh, Ran into uh, PJ, and uh, <laughs> eventually, eventually, we'll be able to talk about big experiences for us when we're allowed to. But I, as I was going to my destination, uh, <laughs> I thought I was being pulled over. Like I, I was kind of speeding. I thought I was being pulled over, so I, I pulled over because I saw the lights come on. And as I pulled over, I, I was in a black car, and then a white car also pulled over behind me so there was two cars pulled over and then the cops got out and they told me to keep going keep going yeah, well, that's so, oh oh my <laughs> oh my goodness my heart was like pounding so I took off and then uh fast forward to when uh me and PJ connected uh we were talking about the same story about he was saying that he got pulled over I said me too and then he was in the white car behind me that got pulled over and I kept going. And what, what are the odds of that? Because we were uh, two hours away from LA and probably another hour away from our destination. <laughs> so like, what are the odds of that? Uh, so yeah, so I, I get pulled over and I see the car in front of me pull over too and the cops get out and they yell at the guy and I'm like, oh, and I'm not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking that's why they pulled me over. The guy, the guy looks at, he, 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 uh, he comes in, he goes, you know why I pulled you over, right? And I'm like, I look at him and I go, because I'm black? Because I'm PJ black? <laughs> <laughs> and he did, he did not think that was funny. Oh, at all. no. Oh, my. <laughs> so he, of course not. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> too soon. Too soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he looks at me and he goes, let's see your license and registration, please. It's probably in the, in the glove compartment. And I look at him. I'm like, oh, it's a rental. So I kind of pull it out here, give him my license, do everything. <laughs> and I'm not wearing the seatbelt, right? So I'm like thinking that's why. So he goes, I pulled you over because you were on your phone. And oh, I go, ooh. and I'm like, I'm like, oh. And then, then, then I cut a little promo on him, a, a humble promo. I go, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, officer. I'm, go, I'm on my way to work. I'm lost right now. And I just looked at my GPS. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. And then, <laughs> and then he let me go. So every time I communicate with PJ, I, t I say, don't be speeding, man. Don't be speeding. <laughs> uh, PJ, I had no idea that you played rugby. What's that? I had no idea that you played rugby. Oh yeah, from, from the age of seven to 17, um, I was gonna turn pro. I turned pro wrestling when I was 16. It was illegal at the time in South Africa to be a professional athlete under 18. Wow. So I obviously lied, made up a birth certificate, uh, wear a, wore a mask with a wig so no one would know it was me. Couldn't tell anybody <laughs> at school. Um, yeah, but then I played rugby and I was gonna, I was gonna play professionally. And then um, I got my first international wrestling tour, which I got paid for. So I was like, I was stoked. Then it was to Dubai. And um, when I got back, they kicked me off a team. So I was like, okay, this is an easy decision. Wrestling it is. Oh, wow. So were you always a fan of wrestling growing up? I know you started, like you said, you started really early. But did you grow up like, you know, like all of us watching WWF okay. and all of that? Yeah, my, and my dad was a wrestler, so I grew up a big fan of my dad, you know, still to this day, he's one of my favorite wrestlers, one of the greatest heels of all time, and you can ask any, any good heel right now, and he'll tell you that. Um, and, you know, like, I started working really young. I started refereeing matches when I was, like, 12 oh. years old. So, oh, that's you know, hard. I grew up in the business, and uh, when I was eight years old, I remember telling my mom, I was like, this is what I'm going to do one day, and she's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And, yeah. I, and 
you know i just committed to that yeah you know, I, I i took three years break i went to college got my degree because my mom said i'll never make it so i got my degree to make her happy and yeah. then i got i got signed out of that and then yeah I moved to the U.S. It took them about 11 months to get my work papers to move to the mm. U.S. Was your dad super supportive when you told him you, that's what you wanted to pursue? Um, he was because he wanted me to, he also ran a promotion. His main oh. goal was, he goes, go, go to the WWE, get famous, and then you come back and take over the company. <laughs> that was the but uh, unfortunately, he passed away when I was 18. And that's when, I, that's when I left South Africa because, you know, he was my best friend. Like my yeah. whole world was kind of destroyed. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to take over the company. I was an 18-year-old kid. Yeah. So I kind of just left and, you know, did, did some soul searching. And I did, yeah, I didn't, I wanted nothing to do with wrestling. I just, I just kind of, like, for two, three years, didn't even watch it. I didn't even know when Vince McMahon bought WCW. I missed that whole era. Oh, wow. That's and a then one. Yeah. And then, I mean, I caught up obviously years later, but then mm -hmm. I went into it. I was walking down the street and I heard bumping at this, like, you know, one of these town halls. And I was like, that sounds like wrestling. So I walked into this show and as I walk in, Johnny Storm was wrestling AJ Styles. And, wow. and I, I just remember as I walked in, AJ did the handspring like backflip and he landed. I've never seen that in my life. And I was like, I'm going to start wrestling again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, immediately got back into it. Yeah, that's really cool because I feel like around that time with guys like AJ Styles and um, all these amazing independent wrestlers who are, um, you know, mainstream stars now, they kind of almost gave wrestling a new renaissance, right? Because uh, before that, it was just all about characters, like big characters like Stone Cold, The Rock, and Hogan, where their ring abilities wasn't as wide as the, as the athletes now. And I remember listening to um, Chris Jericho's podcast and he was talking about to Owen Hart's um, wife and he was saying man like if Owen had been around and if he's um, if he started wrestling you know if he continued wrestling career he would have a career career like a new rebirth because he would have guys like you to wrestle guys like Kurt Angle guys like um, you know him uh, Chris Jericho himself because at that time there wasn't a lot of wrestlers who could wrestle like Owen Hart and I, th I feel like right when you got interested in it that's when the, all these amazing wrestlers started their careers that's true. That's very true. Um, you know, Owen was my dad's favorite wrestler, actually. And I never saw my dad cry and, until the day Owen died. So that was, that was a hard one for us. Um, but yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I, I think talking about the characters, I think that's going to make a comeback. I feel like the, the business is at a place now because wrestling keeps evolving, right? Yeah. We have more athletic guys and kind of like the reality era, as I call it, kind of like it's like fading away. People want to see characters. People understand wrestling. They know what it is. <laughs> and because because uh, like the Marvel movies and the DC movies are so big, people want to see the characters. They want to see the superheroes. You know, they don't want to see a reality show. Like, <laughs> everyone's perfection. like everyone knows what wrestling is. Like they want to see the action, like the, and the characters and the colorful promos and the flamboyant people. I feel like that's what wrestling right now is in. I might be wrong, but like that's what I feel like is going to. So these over the top characters. No, I think you're right, especially during this time, you know, I feel like people need a distraction. They need big characters to um, to kind of distract them from what's going on in the world more than ever. Superheroes. We need superheroes to look up to. Yeah, distract us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll oh, go ahead, Fred. Oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, you keep rocking and rolling, Arnold. Oh, no, no. I was going to ask that. Um, I, I heard somewhere that uh, when you started your wrestling career, your main goal has always been New Japan, even before WWE, what was it about New Japan that attracted you to it? Just the style. I love the style, the strong style. I was always a fan of that. Um, I, I tried to get into the dojo when I was really young, but I tried and I tried, but no one from South Africa has ever made it into wrestling, right? So I, I don't know if they didn't know if I had what it took, maybe subconsciously I didn't know what it took. And I tried and I tried, but then I got signed by WWE and I wasn't going to say no. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just the style, like, you know, like you have the strong style in Japan and, the, and you, you have the British style in Britain and the American style is completely different. And then the Lucha Libre style is completely different. We didn't have a style in Africa. So what I did, I, I combined all those styles together and I called it a hybrid style. And I feel like that's the style everyone on the Indies does now. I'm not taking yes. full credit that I created that. Maybe I started a movement, who knows, but whatever. Uh, you <laughs> did it. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not important. It's just important that, 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 that wrestling evolves and it keeps growing. Can, can you guys imagine where we're going to be 10 years from now? It's going to be nuts. 
It's gonna be nuts. Yeah, you recently told me, PJ, I had no idea uh, that Otunga was a big influence in helping you get your U.S. citizenship. You know, have yep. you made that publicly? Have you said that on podcasts? Has it ever came up? You know. I I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's ever come up in a podcast. I think I've told people personally like you and a few other people, but yeah, he was, he was very instrumental. It was actually, it was him, Steve Kern and Dusty because I had to get three referral letters and you know, it's it a always, great story, bro. That's why I brought it up. It's yeah, a good story. I, I, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, good for bringing it up. Like, yeah, I never even thought about telling that story. I, I'll be all, forever grateful. Um, I was also David Otunga's first match, any second match ever. Whoa. Uh, yeah, so like we, we have some, some history and you know, he's just a good human. You'll never see him be mean to everybody or talk shit about anybody. He's just a good dude. Uh, wait, you, you know. wait, wait, wait. I thought I was his first match. I, I, thought, I thought me and Dave Otunga were the first match on NXT because I remember uh, us like having maybe seven minutes and then as soon as we got in the ring, ding, ding, they said like, take it home and we rushed like two minutes of shit. Right, but that was on TV. That was his first TV match. That was his first match ever. Oh, I'm sorry. FCW. FCW, yeah, yeah. Oh, ever. I'm like, sorry. I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. Like, they're one of those tiny little FCW shows. I think it was at a flea market or some something. And like Kern was go Kern goes, You can do uh this kid's never worked before. He's only been training for a couple <laughs> of months. But I, I trust you. I like you and I, you can do a ten minute Broadway. <laughs> like and, and he wanted the finish wanted the finish to be fish out of water spot for like five minutes i was like oh shit like this guy has no experience whatsoever but hey, we did a we did a decent job and kern loved it so much that he booked it for the next day again wow <laughs> so how was your experience during fcw amazing probably the most fun i've ever had in wrestling think about yes. this right my, my dream was to 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 wrestle professionally like get paid every single day right you know on the indies you kind of like you get paid sometimes and you know how that goes but anyway <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So when I when I signed the contract, moved to the U.S., uh -huh. I, I didn't have any. I didn't have a. I didn't have bills to pay. I didn't have rent. I didn't even have a cell phone. I had like um, Chris uh, Brian Cage pick me up every day at the the place I was staying, take me to the gym, take me to training. Would go to the show, and like for ten months, that's what we did. And that was to me that was living the dream. <laughs> I, didn't to, I didn't have to answer to anybody. I was getting paid to have wrestling matches and go to the gym. <laughs> like, but you said that paid. you didn't have rent to pay at the time. At the time, no. So long story, there's a guy named Joe Gomez and a lot of guys in the business will know him. He was on WCW. Yeah. Uh, and he always helped out the boys. That house that I stayed in was, was for wrestlers. Oh. You know, like Rick Flair in that house, like Chavo lived in that house. Pretty much anybody who's anybody has been to that house and wow. knows Joe Gomez. So just big shout out to Joe. Here, here yes. I was, a kid in a new country. And he just, I called him over the phone and I was like, um, the guy who stayed there originally picking up at the airport he got fired so he just left he just left he was i, I knew him from england so he goes he left me a, a number on a piece of paper and he said just call joe he's a cool dude just tell him you're living in his house i'm like, what? <laughs> like what's happening <laughs> so i'm like really scared i called him I'm like hey uh is this mr gomez uh, my name is pj uh, i'm living in your house and he, he, the first thing he said he goes oh hey little buddy welcome to the u.s <laughs> <laughs> He's just such a good human, and uh, you know, we. He was like, he was like, yeah. Once, once you start making money, once you get to TV, just pay me rent whenever you can. Like, wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, helped out a lot, and he, he helped out a lot of boys. I mean, um, Fred can tell you, he he's a he's just a, a good human. What a sweet man! That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What were you gonna say, Fred? Oh, um, back in the day, uh, back in the day, and I told PJ. Um, uh, at one time he was uh you know with you know kelly kelly and i said um i don't know what the situation happened but like i always said that she's so beautiful you know like you know kelly kelly and then for some reason i don't get in people's business they you know they broke up and me me saying oh you know pj man she's so beautiful man he you know he broke up with her man like oh that pisses me off and then you know Fast forward to years later, he told me it wasn't his fault, you know? Uh, so that's me, like, holding a grudge for, like, so many years. Like a little, <laughs> like a little, like a little puppy, you know? <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's the perception of people usually, you know? But, yeah, they, things didn't work out at the time. I got my heart broken for the first time really bad. Wow. And you're good, I mean, you're a good-looking guy. She's a good-looking woman, you know? Uh, 
I just, you know, you just had it all, man. You just had the looks, the wrestling. I'm just like, oh, man, he's a dog. He's a dog. That's what I'm saying <laughs> in my head, you know? But, you jumping to conclusions, Fred. But yeah, it's, you it's just, okay. Everyone thought that, Fred. Like, literally everyone thought that. And, you know, like, years later, like, that's the perception of people. Isn't that funny how you judge a book by its cover usually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, you know, not good. Not good at all. Not good at all. And then, <laughs> oh, we're all um, guilty of that. We all do that. We all, that's a human thing. Of course. And then many, many, many years ago, uh, you know, I'm a huge advocate for the medicine cannabis. You know, PJ was not about it, you know, and I just like you would frown upon it. Right. When, you know, I, you know, I or other people would do it. Uh, but fast forward to years later, you know, present time. You're all about it, man. I'm like, damn it, man. Where were you years ago, man? <laughs> so interesting story how that happened. Um, yeah, always against it, never tried it in my life. Um, I got injured base jumping. I was out for 10 months. It took me about two years to, to get back to normal. They told me I'll never walk again. I'd, I'd never wrestle again. And in the hospital, I was like, I'm going to show these guys. And they gave me a handful of pain pills. And I, we all know that in our business, a lot of guys get hooked on pain pills. You know, it's so easy with the lifestyle that we live and the travel and the pain that we deal with constantly. People don't realize that. But anyway... I already had a little problem, drinking problem back then. Um, I've never admitted this publicly, so if my mom's watching this, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, huge problem. So they gave me the, 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 the bag of pills, and I was like, I'm going to die. So uh, I started looking. I had 10 months lying, sitting in a wheelchair, so I had a lot of time on my hands. So I started researching alternative healing, uh, alternative medicine, holistic medicines, and stuff like that, and I came across uh, CBD. So I started experimenting with CBD and a bunch of other herbs and stuff. And for me personally, the CBD only works with a little bit of THC. So, you know, so I started taking uh, uh, cannabis and edibles and I started smoking a little bit and like vaping it. And it helped me tremendously. I have arthritis too, like really bad. And it helps me. It helps me to sleep. And that day that I started using cannabis, I quit everything else like I used to be on like some really hard drugs and I just wow. I, I haven't had a, I haven't had a drink since I haven't had touched any opiates since so um, people always say cannabis is the gateway drug so, like for me it was the, the, the gateway to the other <laughs> side actually yeah <laughs> so I, I really believe in it you know and I I moved to California and um, I worked in the business for a long time I help people set up like grow ups and I I help design packaging for for my friends companies and stuff like that uh, i recently just got out of it because I, I i have a few other companies that i that i that i run that i started and uh, it, and it was it was just difficult with all the laws changing so much but i feel like i definitely feel like it helps people and once it goes uh, legal globally i think it'll yeah. be a completely different industry it, it works for some people and for some people it works completely different. So for me, you know, it, it, it only works with a tiny bit of THC. So now I take a lot of THC and a lot of CBD and it works great. <laughs> and it works for many other things too, you know, so. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And, you know, you briefly touched about like, you know, uh, you being in a wheelchair for uh, 10 months and I know that has to really affect you mentally and does that play that period of time does that play a big part of who you are as a person today huge huge I mean um, it put me on the path that I'm on now and I'm very thankful it was the it was the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life but it was the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life like I, I wouldn't be the person I am right now if that didn't happen and you hear that all the time right you hear people going through near-death experiences because I wasn't supposed to live through that I wasn't, I don't know how I made it. I got a second chance and you know, like something in my, something just like opened up and uh, yeah, I'm very thankful for that experience. It was tough. It was incredibly tough. Um, I'm still paying off hospital bills. Like I put myself mm -hmm. into like crazy debt cause I, you know, like I, I, I wanted to get the best doctors, the best physio, the best everything. Yeah. But uh, you know, it was, it was incredibly tough. It took me, a while to get out of that hole mentally, physically, and financially. But, uh, you know, now I'm living my best life. So I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for that. That's awesome, man. Yeah, so physically, how do you feel? Because me, I, you know, we've had our fair share of injuries, but physically mm -hmm. right now, like, how do you feel? Physically, I'm in the best shape of my life. Um, and also... You are. You are because you're always like, I, oh, I, oh, I don't work out. I, 
I don't work out. Arnold, he's one of these guys. Oh, I don't work yeah. out. I don't work out. I work out I one day a week. Come on, how? Well, I do like I do like two or three days a week, but I do fifteen minutes. That's about it. Like, uh, but I, you know, I'm oh. I'm active. Like like this morning, I did like a, a two three hour hike. Uh, I hike mm. up the mountain and then I fly down with my parachute. Uh, oh. You know, I landed on the beach in Malibu. It was incredible. Like, you know, so I stay active. Like, like I'm skydiving always and base jumping. And like, you know, I'm, I'm always active. Like, this was this was this morning's flight. Look, check this. <laughs> Land, landing on the, I don't know if you guys can tell. It's probably just I good. see it. I see it. Yeah. Wow, man. Oh, my goodness. You know, when people look through your YouTube channel, all your stuff, I know people like like to label you as a thrill junkie, but I like how you explain that on past interviews. Like for you, it's not so much of a thrill, but like being in the air is more therapeutic for you. And I believe you had over a thousand jumps at this point or even more, right? Mm -hmm. And it gets better every time too, you know, and it, for me, it's a, it's a form of meditation. Like people think that us adrenaline junkies, we just like need that fix. It's like, oh, let's go, let's go. But you know, base jumping is, is very spiritual. Like, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. We plan for days to do one jump. We don't just go jump off a building or a mountain. There's a lot of planning that goes into it. A lot of like, a lot of like mindset, looking at the weather, learning about yeah. the weather. And that's what I like about paragliding because it just feels like I'm one with nature, you know, like, like I love Mother Gaia so much. I love this planet so much, you know, like, and that's also a new thing for me. And just to be outside and hike and, you know, like the, the new paragliding thing is cool because I fly with the birds. I kind of like watch what they do. Wow. You know? so if, a, if, a bird is, if a bird is not flapping his wings, I, I know he's kind of like either in a thermal or he's catching the wind and he's gliding. So I, today, like I just follow the bird wherever he goes. Wow. And just like, uh, flying with them. It's, it's amazing. And even base jumping. You're base jumping. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of adrenaline in that and it's very tough. But imagine this. So I'm standing on the top of a massive building, right? I'm looking down, like nothing is going through your head. Like you don't even think, oh, I'm gonna die or I have to do this, like nothing. It's just complete, <laughs> complete peace. You don't think of a bill you have to pay, um, like who I gotta wrestle this weekend or like, you know, what I gotta do. Like, it's just you're present in that moment. And that's what meditation is, just trying yeah. to be completely present in that moment. So yeah. to me, that's a form of meditation. How many times did you go tandem before you can do it solo? And how, Zero. No, what? Yeah. You just did solo right away? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's possible. People can do it. Most people just do the tandem to see if they're going to like it because a lot of people, it's not for them. But you, you can do it. You just have to sit through six hours of ground school, like go to pilot school, oh. and, and uh, you actually learn a lot. So it's actually very, very worth it. It's kind of scary. The first, the first 20, 30 jumps was actually very scary. Um, but like, like in anything, you get, once you get over that fear, that's when you grow as a person, you know? So that, yeah. that was, it was very um, rewarding. It was liberating, mm -hmm. if, you, if you will. Yeah. Gabe, uh, I was about to call you Gabriel. Uh, PJ, <laughs> it, PJ, because I just, you know, I'm not used to PJ. Uh, I'm just used to Gabriel, but PJ. Um, that's all good. If, if we were in W, if we, if we were still in WWE, and uh, we could be on the WWE Network. We could definitely have many episodes as, as, uh, as we could of how fearful I would be to do any of that <laughs> jumping, any of that stuff, man. Episode after episode, I would be saying, no, no, no. You are truly a uh, living, breathing darewolf. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Like, maybe we'll do a show on YouTube if you want. I don't know. I'm down. Um, I think PJ should be the host, and the show should be called Freddy Tries. <laughs> it's all the things that BJ Black does. <laughs> no, I like, I like that. Something like that. Uh, we or I got to get compensated because that is a huge risk. <laughs> that is a huge risk. I just don't, I just can't do it for no reason. That's just huge. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's sell it to a TV station and then uh, we'll make sure you get paid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of Darewolf, um, how'd you come up with that name? So at the time, in 2012, um, remember when Twilight was a pretty big movie? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the fans started, because I, obviously I look completely different, like pretty boy. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, the fans started calling me Cape Town Werewolf because mm -hmm. of that movie. Mm -hmm. So years later, I started transitioning into the Daredevil character. And I just took the word da Daredevil and Werewolf, and I made Darewolf. I like it. It a, has a nice ring to it. Yeah, thank and you very much. And then who came up with Justin Gabriel? Was it Dusty or? No, I came up with Justin Angel. 
and um, I guess Vin, I guess oh, Vince that's right, that's right. Remember, yeah. And then I guess Vince was friends with Chris Angel or something. I, they kind of uh-huh. vaguely uh-huh. told me the story. I don't remember, but they changed it without me knowing. Remember the first show, NXT show? Remember the, the first episode? It was live. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. I found I found out as I walked to the ring. That's how I found out it was Gabriel. I was like. I'm, like, no, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just an angel. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you think that one of, watched it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then one of the writers at the time, remember Jen, the redheaded yes. lady? She she yes. goes, she goes, uh, well, Vince changed it. And she told me the whole story. And it's like, you can take it up with him. Just go talk to him. And you know, at the time we were like super young yes. and green. Yes. And I was like, I was like, all right, I, I guess we'll just go with this. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I know you enjoyed uh, FCW a lot, and I know that was a big transition from FCW to the first season of NXT being um, or almost like a game show, a reality game show. I know how Fred feels about it. How, how did you feel about it? <laughs> I mean, it was interesting. It wasn't, it wasn't what they planned. The initial idea, <laughs> remember, um, what's the UFC show where they all live in the house? Oh, I know what you're talking um, about. Ultimate, Ultimate, Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. Ultimate Fighter. So that was the plan. That was supposed to be the plan. They were looking for a house and all this. And you know how wrestling works. They ran out of time. And on the day, they're like, oh, what are we going to do? We have, we have to do a show. And it's live. And we're like, oh, what, let's just do like some kind of challenge or something. Uh-huh. And that's how, those, that's how those challenges started. And many people don't realize this, but most of all, everything was unscripted in the first season. It looked like it. Was, it. Yeah. yeah. It was just freestyling. <laughs> and that's, I think we fucked it up so bad that the second season, they're like, now we got to script this. <laughs> 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 because like I, as a fan you know i would watch it and like i i feel like i have a good sense of like when when things are like a shoot or when things are scripted but like when i, I watched it i felt the nervousness from you guys <laughs> <laughs> i really felt and i could tell that it was just one of those like live raw moments where you just have to like you know like prove yourself in this like little short amount of time which is crazy pressure. I don't know how you guys did it, but Matt and Pops. We, we got tested so many times. I'll tell you one of my most crazy experiences. It was actually, it was me and my, my pro, Matt, against uh, Fred and, C- and his pro, CM Punk. And uh, <laughs> they told us, we're like, we have seven minutes. I'm going to run straight through my comeback, hit the finish, and then we're over. And this is live TV. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I run through the comeback and, you know, the, the, the referee his eyes go like this. That means Vince is in his ear, right? He's like, oh. he's, he's like, he's like, miss the finish, and then we're gonna go to break. Now I've hit my whole comeback. I've hit like pretty much my whole move set on Fred too, and Fred's freaking out. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, we gotta go to break or something. <laughs> so, so I climb up to the 450 and I yell at him. He's like, cut me off, cut me off, and Fred cuts me off. And he goes, what do we do now? I'm like, I don't know. We're in break. We have three minutes to figure it out. <laughs> you remember that, Fred? Uh, I think I think bro. you tagged in Punk and Punk just like took over and he's like, okay, this is what we're I gonna pre- do. And bro, we, uh, somehow somehow we remember. pulled it. No, but somehow go back and watch that match. Like somehow we pulled it off. Like you you uh. crouched me and then I yeah I also I went blank after that. But I, I know we <laughs> we we went over. <laughs> your transition from NXT to when you found out about how you're gonna make your debut as the Nexus on Raw. And by the way, congrats on the 10 year anniversary to both of you guys for that. Um, you know, uh, he talked about how he fell and Tarver and Fred, how, how, how did you feel when you found out the news that that's how you guys were going to be introduced? Um, you know, I was kind of like, eh, whatever, you know, like I was only in developmental for less than a year. So, it, you know, like at the time there were guys that's been there for years, like six, seven years almost. So I was just like, oh, whatever happens, happens. You know, I didn't have any expectations. I wasn't one of those guys like, oh, I got I gotta get out of here. I gotta get onto TV. Like, I didn't care. I was getting paid to wrestle, whether it was on TV, whether it was in, in FCW. I didn't care. So yeah. I was just like, this is cool. And then, but then once it started, and like I was like, oh man, what's happening here right now? You're, you're kind of new. You're walking on eggshells, but we're supposed to be this badass group. So in front of people, we were like totally badass. But like backstage, yeah. we were like, oh, so kind of scary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. You know, and we they made us change in in the, in the broom closet. You know, like not not even in the locker room for the first couple of times but we, we, we were cool with it but you know we all became really close as friends and we still are pretty close most for the most part most of us <laughs> most <people kind> of <laughs> go through stuff and uh 
you know, it, it was it was it was awesome because we were in it together. If it was like one or two people, it would have been very different. But it, it yeah. made it easy because Fred's an awesome dude. You know, Tarver is an amazing guy. I, I, I'm good friends with him. He's actually doing my new intro music, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, he's a good rapper. Yes. Very good. And me and Heath, we traveled together for years. And, you know, me and Stu will always be close. So it was, it was very an interesting time. And I kind of, I kind of just fed off everyone else's energy and like whatever they did, I kind of just went along with it. That's me happy go lucky, just doing my job, you know? Uh, but it, it was definitely an experience. It was fun for me. It was, it was scary at times, you know, and uh, here, here we are wrestling main event. I wrestled John Cena on the, on for like 28 days straight on, on live events, you know? So for me, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a great experience. Some people didn't have amazing experiences, but it, it's like in anything, like in life, it's what you make of it. And I, I had a yeah. great time. And there, there were some really tough moments and some tough conversations with uh, people backstage, but yes, it was received very well. You know, backstage there are people that have worked for that company for like 30, 35 years. And all those people came up to us and be like, Hey, what you guys do, doing is really special and different. Mm -hmm. And that made me yeah. feel good because those people have seen people come and go. They have seen all the storylines, all the characters. And, you know, that made me feel good and that made me just keep going. Yeah. And I think it was really cool for you, PJ, because I feel like, you know, you really stood out from the rest of the group because everyone would be like attacking John Cena on the floor, just like savages. But then you would have that one high spot where everyone like looks up to you like, all right, now hit your move. Mm -hmm. And you were like the high flyer of the group. And that made you um, different than the rest of the group. And I thought that was really, really cool, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of hard to do that because back then, uh, you know, certain moves were banned in the WWE. There were no Germans allowed, no pile drivers, no 450s, all the things. So it was very hard for me to, to get that clear. I had to prove to them multiple times that, that I'm, I can do it safely over and over and over and over again. They made me show them, uh, you know, on an extra one day, you know, because <laughs> the first guy to take it on TV was Regal. And he Regal's like, oh, I've had too many. <laughs> So he goes, he goes, can you show me how to do it? So we, we put, a, we put a, an extra or a dummy there and I just constantly hit it like perfect over and over. And, he goes, okay. <laughs> and you know, and, and John Cena too, uh, think what you will of him. He, he actually pushed for that. <laughs> he pushed for that too. So I'll be forever grateful for that. And you know, you were the first person that I ever saw did that 450 splash move. I never knew that move existed until I saw you. I saw the, you know, the shooting star, a Billy Kidman and everything like that, but I never seen it done forward like that and i thought that was like when i saw it, i was like whoa like, what just what just happened <laughs> thank you thank you it's funny you say that because a lot of people say that and i was like oh there's been a few guys who who, who has done it before me i just i just kind of perfected it but uh <laughs> <laughs> humble brag arnold, you know? <laughs> arnold arnold since day one i told you i did not like pj because one he was good looking and two he would do stuff effortlessly. Still to this day, before matches, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Once I get out there, I'm okay. But yeah. beforehand, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. PJ is just so calm, cool, and collected. I hate it. <laughs> meditation. Meditation. Breathing exercises. Um, before I learned how to meditate, I had to do multiple breathing courses. And people don't realize how important breathing is. Think about this. If you stop breathing, you'll die. You know, like when you get nervous, when you get anxiety, when you cannot sleep, people always go, just breathe. When you have food poisoning, people go, just breathe. And there's a reason for that. And it's kind of been lost in our society. But, you know, the shamans and the, and the witch doctors from our past and the medicine men, they used to teach breathing. Like mm -hmm. there are um, amazing techniques. Like I have breathing techniques that I can, I can breathe through different areas of my body and I can put myself to sleep. I can get rid wow. of anxiety just with breathing. Um, I recently had a DMT trip just by breathing. It's, it's fascinating. Mm. Think about this. Like, um, if this was a video game, which, you know, a lot of people say this is a, a simulated Conspiracy reality. Conspiracy theory, yep. If, exactly. If this was a video game, breathing techniques are the cheat codes. So mm -hmm. why would you not want to be better, be healthier, be smarter, be, you know, like, why, why would you not learn that? I feel like somehow society has suppressed that, but there are a lot of gurus and teachers out there who teach these things. I'm really glad that, you know, we kind of touched on this because and on a personal note, um, like two weeks ago, I've, I've experienced my first anxiety attack. Like, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't even, 
I, I couldn't even explain that. Like, what's, what's wrong with me? And like, I went to urgent care. They did blood work and everything was fine. And uh, the doctor was like, you're probably um, stressed. It might have been an anxiety attack. I'm like, wait, what? Um, so because of that, to take care of my health, um, I started doing yoga in the morning. And I started like meditating and breathing more. And like, I just hear from, from people that experience what I experienced. They're like, when it happens, just breathe through it. And like, you're going to be okay. So um, all, this, all, all of what you're about your life is actually what I'm starting to be into because of what happened. You know, I'm just trying to lead, like live a better, healthier life. And a part of that, I know, I know you're also not big on supplements. And um, I, I've taken sup like pre workout since I was 16 years old. I'm 33 right now, so I think a part of that, the reason why my heart was it was going so fast, the doctor said it's probably because of that, like so much like caffeine in my system that I need to quit it like cold turkey. So I'm I'm going into more of your lifestyle now, you know, trying to adapt. It, it, it seems like it's working for you. So <laughs> it is. It's awesome. And 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 it, it's I, all these things will be my book. I will I will write down meditations. I will write down mantras that I use, breathing techniques, and kind of like guide people into the into that kind of lifestyle. If mm -hmm. people are interested in that, um, you know, it's going to take a little while to finish this book, but all that stuff will be in there. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a lifestyle. When, once I stopped using supplements, my body just changed immediately. Like my body just, just changed. Like, it, and I was like, hmm. So I started doing research and my background, my degree, I have a master's degree in sports nutrition and that's my passion. Mm. And nutrition is my passion. And they, you know, like they don't teach these things like the, the bodybuilding community. I love bodybuilding. It's a great sport, but they, they, they unfortunately teach a lot of wrong things, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. in nutrition mm -hmm. you know, supplements. Supplements can help, but a supplement should be exactly that, a supplement. You need to supplement what you're missing from your diet. Mm -hmm. So if you just eat real organic whole foods and people go, oh, it's so expensive. Like how much money do you spend on supplements? Like if you yeah. have to buy BCAAs and whey protein every month, that's a lot of money. I can yeah. just take that money and I buy real organic fruits and veggies and meats. I get all my meats from a local farm here. Yeah. You know, like uh, people are like so against meat, but to me, it's uh, the process. I obviously don't like the mass produced stuff. I won't eat it. Like I won't eat meat at a fast food place or a restaurant most of the time. You know, I'll, I'll make it at home. I know where the source is. I know that they treated the animals good. At the end of the day, it's all energy, right? Everything, yeah. all, the, all the energy that we get is from the sun. Think about this. The sun feeds the plants. And when you eat the plants, that's that you're eating the energy from the sun. When you're eating the animal, the animal eats the plants. Now we're just eating the animal. It's just, yeah. it's just a, it's the cycle of life. It's the food chain. That's just normal. Lion King, so, circle of life. Pretty much, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so going back to your career, you know, um, you've had a lot of accomplishments in WWE, uh, multiple time tag team champions. How much fun did you have tag teaming with Heath Slater, man? <laughs> so much fun. I love that guy, man. He's like my brother, you know, like I came to the US and I didn't have my family here and me and him traveled together for the first two years shared a car, shared a hotel room. So I became very close to him. And, and Fred can tell you that and anybody can tell you that. That, that, yes. that guy is such a good human. Yes. <laughs> yes. And of course, after um, you know your WWE career ended, you opened a whole new chapter to your wrestling career, made a big name to yourself. Well, I, but you were already you were already PJ Black before Justin Gabriel, right? So you were PJ Black once again. And of course, you were on um, you joined Ring of Honor. How was that experience for you? Amazing. Like, uh, you know, I had a couple of options. I had the option to go back to, to WWE, NXT. Um, and I was like, mm, I've already done that, been there, got the t-shirts, still getting royalties for the action figures and the video games. So I just wanted to do something new. And I wanted to be um, just, I wanted to be me. I wanted to be PJ Black. You know, like, I don't want to play a character that's Justin Gabriel, which was cool. It was fun. I mean, I, and I love WWE. I still love watching it. I just, I just, I feel like wrestling is an art form and for some people they can kind of take direction that you can tell them what to do and they'll do it. And a lot of people have families, so they have to go that route. For me, I'm, I, I need to create, I need to express. And how do I do that? That the wrestling is my, my platform. So I, I, I'm, I'm actually working on a, on a new character right now and I'm very Ooh. excited to, to debut it. Um, it's, it's going to be awesome. Like the gear, I spend so much money on the gear. The music is coming. Um, we were filming a couple of origin stories of how this character became about. That's exciting. Um, but it's very exciting. I, um, I haven't been this excited about wrestling since I started. I think it's cool that you're able to reinvent yourself because everyone, I feel like everyone who hasn't seen you in a while and has seen and just saw a glimpse of PJ Black at Ring of Honor, 
I think a lot of people are shocked to how like how different you look from your Justin Gabriel days, you know? Right. And I, I think as an artist, that's important. Or it can go both ways. You know, you have guys like Rey Mysterio who can just be Rey Mysterio his whole life. Yeah. But you get you have guys like look at Jericho, like he keeps evolving. You know, you have yeah. to keep changing. And for me, that it's fun. It's it's fun to change and, and try new things and you know, like, it's funny you say that because a lot of people come to me and say, oh, shit, I didn't realize you were Justin Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> like, m the most hardcore fans know, but there are still some fans that don't know. And that's my goal. My goal is to, when I'm done with wrestling, I want people to remember PJ Black. Yeah. In Ring of Honor, um, I know you had you have a blast there. Who's, who's your favorite opponent? Like, what's your favorite match that you had there so far? See, that's tough because uh, that was one of the deciding factors of signing with ROH. I looked at the roster and I was like, Man, I can have great matches with all of these guys. And if, if they give me creative freedom, I will just run with that. And that, right. so far I've wrestled, you know, I've had, it's hard to pick one guy. Like Jay Lethal is amazing. Oh, Bandito, yeah. Bandito is the future of wrestling. Bandito and Flip Gordon, those two kids are going to be the future mm. of wrestling. I'm telling you, Bandito is going to be the next Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that. And then we have a great roster. Dragon Lee, a lot of young kids, you know, and a lot of OGs too. That's a, it's a great roster and I've, I've gone through like half of them and I'm excited to, to wrestle the rest of the guys. And you know, ROH is a great company. You know, like a, a lot of guys come from ROH and I, I feel mm -hmm. like I've done it in reverse. Like I was over there, yes. but now I'm over here. But you know, it's, it, it's growing. It's a, they give me creative freedom. They give me everything I want. You know, like I, I get treated really well, which in some companies you don't, unfortunately, if you, if you're mid card or lower, you know, sure. and it's just like, it's, 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 it's great. Like I, I love it. I, it, Every day, I look forward to going to 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 work. I heard the merchandise deal is not that bad either for Ring of Honor. <laughs> yeah, and and everyone has a different deal. I got a really good deal, like like a really good deal. So yeah, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm really stoked. And it's funny, funny story too. And <laughs> so Sinclair, who owns ROH, uh -huh. is, yes. is is worth I think like six times that the amount that WWE is worth. And Vince tries to buy ROH apparently every year. And this oh, year they were like, eh, how about we buy you guys? Oh. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine how pissed Vince was? Oh my gosh. That's amazing. PJ, PJ, do you have a dream match or have you had your dream match? I've had so far, I've had a multiple of pretty much all my, all my dream matches. I have one left to go and I have one goal left in wrestling. I have, I finished my bucket list of wrestling. Mm -hmm. I have one, one goal left and one dream match left. What's I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you the goal because it's okay. going to happen soon. I like Freddie that. knows. I like so it's, that. everyone will know soon, but, um, the dream match is Okada and it's always been, even, oh, yeah. even, even before he was okay. where he is right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's gonna be an amazing match. Well, who are some of your favorites to share the ring with off the top of your head? <sighs> so many guys for different reasons, you know, like you, you know, like even, even guys that weren't good workers, like it, it's a challenge to have good matches with them. And I have always mm -hmm. pr pride myself on, on having good matches with guys like this. And you, you know how it is. You got to kind of adapt and change things yes. around. And then yes. when it comes off, that's the hardest thing to do in wrestling. Most people don't realize is to put mm -hmm. matches together, to make, to tell a good story, to make it flow. Mm -hmm. um, in WWE or on TV shows, we, we are fortunate to have agents and producers to help us with that stuff. Cause there's, there's people who don't know how to do these things. And there are very few people who are good at that. You know, like a few names come to mind, like Arn Anderson, Jamie Noble, mm -hmm. uh, TJ Wilson, mm -hmm. um, you know, guys like who has a mind for, for wrestling. And that's why those guys become agents because they're yeah. so good at what they do. But yeah, in the ring, I mean, I love mm -hmm. wrestling Evan Bourne. I, I, I love wrestling yeah. all the guys. Of, I love wrestling AJ Styles. I only wrestled him one time. It was amazing. Um, so many guys. I love wrestling Ricochet. That guy is phenomenal. Right. Just the way his mind works. Obviously, we Ooh, know don't get me is. don't get me started with him. Don't get me started with him, PJ. He you guys, you, uh, heat? you guys have heat. Oh no, no he, was it? <laughs> no he, honey. I remember one time I was backstage. I was backstage just visiting, being nosy with WWE after my release, and I was in catering, and like he came right up to Arnold and I, and he was like talking to us, being friendly. I was like, man, he is very handsome. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's a good dude, man. He's a, he's really really talented. He's gonna go far, I think. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, man. And um, you know, with uh, Ring of Honor and everything, and that your success in that, is there a part of you that's like, you know, one of these days, I might just I might go back to WWE. Um, I thought about that, and um, 
never say never, but mm. probably never, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. I mean, you know, I, I feel like it depends what happens. If, if I can go back under my terms and if I can be, if I can be PJ black and lay, let me be PJ right. black, obviously right. I'm going to, I'm going to run with it, but yeah. I'm super happy with where I am right now. I have a multi-year deal with a, with an extension period. And yes. you know, if it keeps going that way, I'm making more money than I have ever have. I'm, awesome. I'm I have more freedom. Um, I can sky a base, base jump. No one's going to tell me not to do it. Um, <laughs> you know, I have, I have a really good schedule. <laughs> I have a really good travel schedule, which is very important. Fred yeah. will tell you this, like oh, yes. traveling is hard. And if you can pick your travel, that makes a huge difference, like mm -hmm. a massive, massive difference. Um, what are your thoughts on like these wrestling um, shows like Raw, WWE, AEW with, with no fans? I know that's, that's heartbreaking to a lot of wrestlers. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? I, I don't like it at all. I, for me, wrestling is about the, the interaction with the fans, the energy. We feed off that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, to yes. me, it's about the show, the, the pyro, the loud music. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, you know, that's, that's what it's about. And now we don't have that. It just feels flat. It's very hard for yes. me to watch. Um, I, I, I haven't, I just recently did my first one in Tirina match. Uh, Fred was there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it was, it, was, it was weird. It wasn't enjoyable. It wasn't, it was just like, it was like, eh, whatever. You know, I hope it comes across on TV differently, but it's it's not fun, man. But you know, it's it's what we got to do. It's our job. We can't like pick and choose those things. And um, um, I feel like you know, everyone's just trying to do the same thing too, because no one knows what's what's going on. Yeah, but I feel like ROH is going to do something completely different. And I'm excited for you guys to see that. Oh, I can't wait. I know you talked in the past interview that um, you guys are supposed to have this like epic show that got canceled because of uh, you know the state of like the world right now but i hope that happens again you know when everything opens up because i know you were super excited about that yeah because it was gonna it was gonna be a complete new thing that no one's ever seen in wrestling which is very hard to do and it's it was it was gonna be very unique and it was literally it was in vegas and it was literally on the plane because i live in la everyone else yeah. comes from the other coast right everyone else was already there and yeah. they were like on the way to the airport, they're like, don't go, don't go, don't go. So it was, I was the only one who was not in Vegas. And yeah, that's when this thing happened. What a, what a, what a time that we live in. It's weird, man. I feel like we're living in a movie right now. Definitely <laughs> yes. a movie. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> you just want it to end. Like, I just want the movie to end already. <laughs> yeah, right. But you know what? It, it's, it's bad in a lot of ways. But think about this. We, we go back to the story I just told. Like, my, the, the hardest part of my life was the yeah. most I, I went through. So I feel like as, as, as a planet, as, as a, you know, there's a lot of separation right now and whether, whatever you believe this, this is, you know, a lot, a lot of people have their own theories about this, but I feel like if we can get past the separation part and we sure. can all come together, this will be a massive growth for, for us as humans. Yeah. And I really love your, um, your perspective on that because like, I know you said in past interviews that, you know, the mind is a very, um, strong and powerful thing. And like, it's all about just being responsible at like not not careless but just be responsible but still live your life and like you, you talk about how like the power of like um what is it the, the law of attraction like if you're just scared at home all the time not wanting to go out like being scared of uh getting sick all the time then most likely based on that energy you might <laughs> you're you're gonna get sick but if you just yeah. have that um like uh effect that like you know what i'm I'm healthy. I'm taking care of myself in other ways. I've been like I'm eating good. I'm being safe, and uh, I still want to enjoy 2020. Then most likely, then that's what you're gonna do, right? Exactly, and and that's been proven scientifically because a lot of people will be like, oh, that's some mystic stuff or some esoteric stuff or some mystical stuff, and it's been proven scientifically. <laughs> you can go, you can go look that up. You know, everyone knows what the placebo effect is and how that works, right? Yeah. So the, the opposite of the placebo is called the nocebo effect. So that's mm. like that's like you said, like. If you sit home and you're really scared the whole time, you're lowering your vibration, you're going to get sick. If you think the law of attraction, the opposite of that is the nocebo effect. If you walk down the street and you're like, oh, I'm going to get mugged, I'm going to get mugged, you're probably going to get mugged. <laughs> you're, you're, you're manifesting that. You're putting that in the universe. That's just how it works. And a lot of people say, oh, that's just heebie-jeebie stuff. And I used to be one of those people until I experienced it. And it's, it's, it's once, you, once you figure that part of life out, your life will change. I promise mm -hmm. you. I love that, man. I love that. I think people should um, have that perspective, you know, to 
be mentally more healthy and just not be so scared all the time and be at peace. Right. And it, but it's hard. It's, it's, it it's not hard. easy. Yeah. It's very hard. It's like, it's, it's, you have to reprogram yourself, right? It's, mm -hmm. it, that's what, I mean, people call it brainwashing. Let's call it social engineering because that's what it is. Like you, you learn the things that your parents taught you and what their parents taught them. And it, for most times it's, it's not correct, unfortunately. So yeah. I tell people this all the time. You have to follow your heart. No one knows what your truth is. Your, your mom can be like, Hey, you have to be a lawyer. You have to go be, be in a bank. But what if that's not my truth? That's what, that's not what I want to do. Yeah. I'm not saying don't listen to your parents, <laughs> but you know, like nobody knows you, but you, like you, yeah. you know, and yeah, it's, 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 it took me a while to figure it out. It took me about 36 years to figure that out. But, and I feel like everyone will figure it out. Some people figure it out early in life. Some people figure it out really late, but it doesn't matter. It will come to you when the time is right. I love that. I love that. You know, Arnold, this is just yet another episode of sitting under the learning tree for me. I always say it on every podcast. Uh, it's very therapeutic to do a podcast for me, talking about wrestling, having friends on the podcast. So, PJ, uh, definitely thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, before we go, I wanted to do 21, and I do this with all the guests, 21 totally random questions. Our last guest last week, we had the Godfather on. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was boom, 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 boom with his answers. The first time I did it, I did it with my mom on IG Live, and it was a disaster. But however, <laughs> however it flows, man, just 21 random questions, no big deal. So are you down to uh, do this? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, number one, what's your favorite thing in your closet right now? Uh, my my uh, sacred geometry hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> when things break do you per prefer to fix it or replace it it depends what it is if it's electronic i'll try to fix it if it's a relationship i'll try to fix it if anything <laughs> else i'll just throw away yes yes what job would you be absolutely horrible at uh pretty much anything that's not athletic <laughs> <laughs> what really wow uh, no, i no, i don't know that's tough i'm i'm, I'm pretty i'm not I'm good at pretty much everything. It's a tough life, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I love what, it. What's your favorite uh, movie ever? Um, I have two, Boondock Saints and um, The Rock with Sean Connery. Mm. What's the most disturbing thing you've ever witnessed? Disturbing? Disturbing, yes. Um, I, love, I live in LA. I, I, see, uh, I see homeless guys take a shit on the street and shoot up everyone <laughs> on the street. <laughs> oh. God, please. <laughs> if you had the world's attention for 30 seconds, what would you say? I would teach the world how to meditate and how to breathe. Bingo. What's your biggest pet peeve? Uh, people that have pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes you anxious? Um... Not a lot of things. You, you said earlier that, that you got your first anxiety attack. I did too. It was my first one and I didn't know where it was coming from. I had to work with two shamans to, to figure out what it was. And um, it was something spiritual that I won't go into right now. Maybe some other time. <laughs> yeah. uh, what is the stupidest thing you've ever done because someone dared you to? <sighs> Every weekend that happens. <laughs> Oh, what's your favorite swear word? Um, uh, uh, my first language is Afrikaans, and we have a lot of really good swear words. So, and uh, I don't think I can say it on here. I mean, maybe I can say because no one would understand. Poos. <laughs> Sounds funny. <laughs> yeah. The way oh, I'll tell you guys later what it means. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is one food that you would never give up? Meat. Mm -hmm. If you have three people over, dead or alive, for dinner, who would they be? Nelson Mandela, uh, Eminem, and uh, Graham Edward. Uh, he's, wow, uh, he's funny. Eminem always makes the list. Like I've heard these questions so many times, and like it's, Eminem's always there. That's so funny. Uh, he's had a huge yeah. impact on my life. I know a lot of people don't like him, and you know, but I he's love had, him. Uh, he, yeah, he's had a massive impact on my life. I, he helped me through some dark times, some light times. You know, he's, I think, he's incredible. You know, like he can. He can do funny songs. He can do serious songs. I, I like how he has the personality. He's Eminem or he's um, Slim Shady. I, I yeah. And you can feel the personalities too. Like the way he changes it. There's not a lot of rappers who can 
who can rap words and on the on the beat on the pitches. There's very few guys that can do that, and I think he's a master at that. In junior high, I bleached my hair platinum blonde, and I wear I wore my visors backwards, and I was <laughs> all about the eight mile movie. I did like those like freestyle battles after school. I was all about yeah, it, man. Yeah. I'm right Me there. Too. Me too. Uh, <laughs> what is the worst backhanded compliment you've ever been given? Ah, uh, wow. I got to think about that one, but there's been quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> I got to think about it. Uh, oh, wow. I got I to think about that. Let's go next. Is your belly button inner or outer? Inner. Inner. Who is your, fa who is your first celebrity crush? Um, uh, Vanessa Hutchins, and it's still her. <laughs> um, what's something you've tried that you'll never try again? Uh, lobster. What? <laughs> I'm not a fan. Oh my god. Poor people eat that. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh, what was your first job? Um, I was a security guard at the rugby stadium, and my job was to, um, uh, at the end of the game, when the whistle blew, the doctor gave me two numbers on a piece of paper, and I had to grab them for a drug test and make sure they didn't take anything from their doctor or go to the bathroom or anything like that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> What's your favorite TV show? Um, Money Heist on Netflix. Uh, I, but watch it. Don't watch it in English. It, uh, I think the, it's it's a, a show from Spain. It's called Casa de Papel. Mm. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Is there a personality trait you can't stand? Mm, yeah, people that are that are unethical and that lie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Best gift ever received. Spotify. My girlfriend recently, she was like, you have to get Spotify. You have to get, and I was like, nah, nah. And then she, she goes, I'll get it for you as a gift. She paid for it and changed my life. Like I've discovered uh -huh. so much like new music and artists that I never thought I'd listen to. Bingo. I love it. I love it. Same here, brother. Uh, <laughs> 21, last but not least, toilet paper over or under? It, it doesn't matter. Like my, my girlfriend. <laughs> You're the first you one that said that. Yeah, so it doesn't matter to me. It's different. Like, I mean, I'm ambidextrous too. Sometimes I'll use this hand. Sometimes I'll use this hand. <laughs> when, 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 and I, when I was in a wheelchair, I broke both my legs, wow. but I also lost a piece of my finger, which they saved, by the way. Wow. So I couldn't, I couldn't use this hand for 10 months. So I had to. Like, <laughs> that happened in 2017, right? 16. 16, I believe. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, I mean, PJ, definitely, I know time is money. I really appreciate you being on the podcast, sharing your story. I always say don't die with the story and you tell it. And I really appreciate you being on, bro. Hey, I had so much fun with you guys. Thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, the, it, it was awesome. You guys are amazing. It, that was probably the best flowed interview I, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think I've ever done. So I thank you guys so what, much. Thank you. What? Thank you for telling your stories. On. Wait, hold yeah. on. You didn't have a good one with Ryback? What do you mean? Good story? What? No, I thought like uh, you, you said that you've done a few podcasts, but there was like connections that were messing up. Oh, yeah. So, so Ryback never used to uh, interview people. Um, he, you know, he just he likes to hear his own voice. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 think I, I think I was the first person that he interviewed and we, we did one. But I was in, a, I was in Manhattan Beach and the, 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 service, the service wasn't that good. I haven't listened to it back because I was like, oh, man. <laughs> and we, we, talked, we talked for hours too and it was actually a two-part thing i think and, oh wow uh, yeah and i mean we we got deep and we got into some stuff but i don't know how the connection was and i don't know how the sound was you know that makes a big difference yeah the two absolutely. people's experience yeah <laughs> well it was a pleasure meeting yeah. you man and again thank you so much for doing this you know um you're definitely one of my bucket list of um people to talk to and man i can't wait for your book to come out man finish that thing already because i feel like the world yeah. needs it I think so too, man. And I'm very excited about that. And you know, I'm not trying to make money out of this. I'm just trying to teach people. I don't, I, I, that's, that's all I want to do. Teach everything. There's going to be a lot of controversial things in there that a lot of people are not going to um, resonate with, but that's my truth. And I, I've, I've been doing a lot of um, studying on all this stuff and, and yeah. a lot of research. It's a lot of research. That's what's going to take me another year at least. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's uh, yeah, I'm excited to teach people what I have learned. It's a perfect time to, 
take this uh, Pro and Bro Wrestling podcast home, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so okay. much. Thank you. Man, such a great episode with PJ Black, man. Like, he's he's such a chill and, like, really just a good dude, you know? I feel like, I feel like I'm more of a big fan of him of, on how he approaches life more than wrestling. He's a great wrestler, and I'm a big fan of his wrestling career, but I'm a fan of his outlook in life, which is really cool. Junior, what what the heck is Junior doing? Oh, he never does that, man. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on with him. Yeah, but I was glad I was able to get that um, out of my system, the story about how when <clears throat> I first met him and we were doing the Nexus, that I didn't like him. Yeah, yeah I didn't like him. Uh, but fast forward, of course, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, him and I are great friends and stuff like that. So I'm glad I was able to make that known and tell him, you know, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever done that in my 36 years on this planet, you know, but uh, <laughs> PJ is a great guy and uh, definitely a great story, a plethora of knowledge, very easygoing. Um, you know, I, like I said, I still get nervous before matches, but he's just calm cool and collected and uh he's definitely an og he started in 97 i started in 2002 well you know what time it is baby like Jake <laughs> Snake. 56 in the books thank you guys so much for watching and listening if you're listening to us on itunes make sure you guys give us a five-star review and if you're watching us on youtube make sure you guys give us a thumbs up and leave a comment to let me know what we can do better and until then fred Block the hate, salute the great Arnold Telegaarta. Episode 56 is in the can, baby. You see how I keep going? <laughs>